Um, we've had requests to record this session because there are people who couldn't make it today. We are going to ask you to participate quite a bit today through an anonymous polling software. Um, so just so you're aware that the recording is happening, if you have questions for us because things come up during this session that are more personal in nature, we are going to keep this session open for another 30 minutes at the end. So if you'd like to stay and have a conversation, we will be turning the recording off at that time. Um, we'd like you to start by adding your name and unit to the chat so we get a sense of who's here today. And um, if you'd like, there is a renaming function on Zoom. If you hover over your own name, you should get a little box that says more with a drop down arrow. And if you want to click on that, you can um, change your name. If you want a more personal name there that you use more frequently, you can add pronouns if you'd like. Um, you could add your unit if you want to, but we'd love to see your unit in the chat as well. So if you want to take a minute and just throw your name and your unit in the chat, thank you so much. Um, I also want to let you know that you can turn on captions today. Zoom has added all kinds of languages for captions. I was just playing with it. So I can tell you that when you click on the CC button, it goes on and off for the captions. If you want to change the language, you hit a little carrot button and it'll give you all kinds of languages that you can use. All right. Thank you for putting your names in the chat. This is great. Nice to see people from all over series. Wonderful. We have some grad students, which is great. So some of these acronyms are NSIDC is the National Snow and Ice Data Center. GML is a global monitoring laboratory. SWIPC is a Space Weather Prediction Center. I'm so proud of myself. I'm learning all the acronyms. PSL, it's a Physical Sciences Laboratory. ALOCA is a really awesome program located in the National So Nice Data Center. Did I get everyone? CSL, Chemical Sciences Laboratory. All right, HR is Human Resources. Great, awesome. Um, okay, so one other thing I want to share in terms of access needs is that it's an inclusive practice to actually read all the words on our slides. So we're going to be doing that today, and it actually helps us slow down too and let you read with us so that you're, we're not talking over you reading those words. So that might feel different to you today, but that's a practice we're going to try on today. So welcome to the Implicit Bias in the Workplace training. I'm Becca Edwards. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Series Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director, and I'm going to pass it to Lucia. Hi, I'm Lucia Harrop. I um, am the CSERDS and series liaison with NOAA, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm Jimena um, Ogas. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm the talent acquisition and training manager within series HR. Awesome. So we, the three of us decided to combine and do this workshop together because we actually framed every Thing we're going to do through three lenses. So one is through the lens of how bias shows up in hiring. One is the lens through how it shows up in supervisory evaluation. And one is how it shows up on teams. So each of us have a little expertise in one of those areas. And so we're going to um, be sort of switching off and giving you ideas on all three of those areas. All right. So um, the goals of our session is that we, we're going to start by describing the elements of inclusive work environments. And then we're going to work most of this time distinguishing between different types of implicit bias. It turns out that people engage more with the concept if we give really specific examples. And there's lots of types, but we're going to go through some types that are really common and then talk about how they show up in hiring processes, recommendation letters, performance evaluation, and team dynamics. And then we're going to give examples on how to interrupt implicit biases. So where we're going to ask you to engage with us a lot is give us your own examples. When we describe a type of bias, where are you seeing it show up or what's the ways in which it shows up in your particular space? Because we know that it, it plays out in very unique ways, depending on your space. All right, so we're going to practice using the polling so software with this question. So Lucia is going to put a link in the chat, but we're also going to have a QR code on the screen. And we just want you to submit three words that come to mind when you think about a scientist. So I'll go ahead and launch that poll. So you can use the QR code in the top right part of the screen, or you can join by web. This works really well if you just use a word, not a phrase, because it's going to create a word cloud. So just three words that come to mind when you think of a scientist.
And once you add one word, it should let you add another, and it'll show you the words at the bottom that you've added. Oh, this is so fun. <laughs> I love word clouds. Oh. Awesome. So how word clouds work is a word gets bigger the more times that it's inserted, if you haven't seen this before. So we're seeing intelligent and smart and curious and logical as the most common responses. Creative is starting to get more shout outs here. Glasses, <laughs> speakers, introvert, motivated, collaborative, awesome. All right, so the good news about using this polling software is that all you have to do is keep that screen open on your phone or your computer. And as we go through more polls today, you can just keep using the same screen. It'll just refresh with what our next question is. So here's our word cloud. I'm going to give it 10 more seconds. Awesome. OK, so one of the reasons we did this is because bias shows up in a really, uh, we're going to talk mostly about unconscious bias today, right? So um, if you've ever done the Harvard Implicit Bias tool, what it has you do is, is answer really quickly to questions, right? So when we're trying to get it in unconscious bias, we don't wanna be thinking it's an instinct or it's really deep inside of our psyche. And so when you ask people just to give you a word, there's like an immediate association. So this is showing us a little bit of our bias about scientists. So I'm gonna show you another way that I use this question to surface bias and see if I could actually shift that bias. So, I was teaching a chemistry class at Front Range Community College, and I asked students the same question at the start and the end of the semester. So give me three words that describe the scientist. Same question. So during the semester, I did weekly scientist spotlights where I highlighted the work of a scientist from a historically excluded group in STEM, and then included stories about persistence through challenges in their career journeys. So for example, I highlighted a biologist who was transgender, who had transitioned from female to male, and then was told that his work was much better than his sister's, right? So I would talk a little bit about how people were talking to this person and how they would navigate that or how they would navigate being excluded. And so you can see at the start of the semester, they had similar answers to you, intelligent, curious, right? But there, if you look at those words, there's a little bit more of either a negative connotation, like evil, <laughs> nerdy. For them, nerdy was a negative connotation. Um, or much more sort of um, concrete, like sterile, hypothesis, lab coat, thesis. And at the end of the semester, even though the same word, so it's a little hard to shift bias, right? The, and that's not necessarily a negative bias that scientists are intelligent and curious, that's good, right? But I saw a little bit more of them seeing scientists as human beings that they could relate to, like fun, passionate, dedicated, creative, cool, hardworking. That, some of the words did change over time. And if I pulled out the specific words for a student, where they went from before and after, I could see a little more of a specific change because of my spotlights. So it's just a way to think about, like, how do we start to interrupt bias and tell, start to tell new stories in our head about certain things? Because we can be really unconsciously moving through life with a story if we don't interrupt it. So to get into why we wanna interrupt bias, we're gonna engage with this next poll question. And this is a little bit more challenging. So what is the difference in your mind between an environment that's welcoming and environment that's inclusive? What is the difference between an environment that's welcoming and an environment that is inclusive? You can think about any environment. It doesn't have to be a work environment. It could be a home environment when you go into somebody's home or when you, um, Maybe you have a community that you participate in outside of work. This It should be more of a, you're gonna have a chance to enter a phrase this time. What's the difference between an environment that's welcoming and an environment that's inclusive? Do 
So some of these are some of the characteristics that might be different in the two environments. It looks like people are putting words in, but you can put in a phrase, like I think a welcoming environment is this and an inclusive environment is this, right? Friendliness versus comfort. Proactive empathy, welcoming feels like a warm start and a safe for me. Smiles. Empathy. Oh, they're synonyms, yeah. A welcome environment can still imply someone is an outsider. Equitable belongingness. Might, there might be some difference in belonging. Welcoming open to all, inclusive open to all with adaptations that make it easier to be welcomed. Interesting. Warm versus vibrant. Welcoming is surface level and at the beginning of a relationship, inclusive is long-term and deeper. Intentional. Open discussion. Nice. Welcoming is an initial response. Inclusive is an ongoing response. That's a nice way to sort of talk about how there are synonyms, right? Inclusive means acknowledging differences. Awesome. Empathy. Acceptance of everyone. Social versus equity. I think this is the same idea, right? So there might be a surface social inclusion in a welcoming environment. Whereas when we get into equity, we're thinking more about how people have different needs and might be different things to feel included in that environment. Welcoming is friendly, inclusive environment draws you in to participate. Awesome. Okay. Friendly, inclusive means you do not have to change to fit in. Awesome. Oh, these are so great. Thank you so much for participating in this poll. An inclusive environment invites my contributions. Inclusiveness feels like they're trying to understand you and others and how you work. Awesome. So this is leading me to my next slide. So there's nothing wrong with a welcoming environment. It's just distinct. We're trying to make a distinction perhaps between welcoming and inclusive. And a lot of people are noting that welcoming is initial warmth, right? Like I welcome you into my home. Come on in. This is my home. But inside my home, I might need you to be to, to behave in my home the way that I feel comfortable, right? Inclusive is I'm thinking a little bit more about everybody's needs. How do I make sure everyone has an option um, to participate in that environment? So this is a quote from um, a person I follow on LinkedIn. An organization can be welcoming but non-inclusive. So welcoming culture emphasizes politeness and friendliness and how people present themselves to others. An inclusive culture, on the other hand, is about intentionally creating an environment where any individual or identity group is respected, valued, and empowered while ensuring different perspectives are sought, acknowledged, and considered. So you can imagine how that inclusive culture is a little harder to do if we haven't started to understand our biases. So if we're the person who leads a space and we have certain biases that are playing out and aren't being interrupted, we're more likely to be creating a welcoming culture that might um, mean that other people have to assimilate to be in that space. So we're gonna to work today on disrupting norms. So the status quo, how things have always been done doesn't work for everyone. And many people don't thrive in our current model. We also wanna question our assumptions that we all make assumptions about others and that these assumptions can be detrimental and prevent us from digging deeper. This brings always in the idea of intent versus impact, right? So implicit bias, we're in the space where we're not meaning to not be inclusive, but we're wanting to surface that maybe we're not. Even though our intention is to include everybody, there might be something we're doing that's putting up a barrier to that, and we just need to question our assumptions in order to get there. Um, and then we can work on building relationships because when we have trusted relationships at work, everyone feels more comfortable sharing their process, asking questions and discussing mistakes, which ultimately helps the team problem solving process. So we're working to create inclusive work environments at Sears where any individual is respected, valued and empowered and different perspectives are sought, acknowledged and considered. So in order to start questioning our norms and assumptions, we have to identify our own implicit biases about other people on our teams and in our organization. And just like in our first um, exercise on scientists, we all have biases, but the, the goal is not to say that I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be bias free someday. This is deep, deep in our genetic makeup that we have a biases that have been in place really for survival reasons. So to interrupt them, it takes work. It takes intentional work and it might be a little uncomfortable. Um, so just to define bias, it's an inclination or prejudice for or against one person or group. An implicit bias is the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understandings, actions, and decisions in a subconscious manner. These biases are activated involuntarily 
and without individual awareness or intentional control. So they do develop over time. Sometimes it's something that we're a bit pulled to because of our family and our upbringing. And the, they've done a lot of studies that show that one or two year old children can actually show they have bias um, towards or against certain individuals. But then we also get direct and indirect messages from our environment that can reinforce biases or create new ones. Um, they establish parameters about what we are to think and feel. So when, when we're in a space, this bias does control our emotions. And so the more you're aware of it, the more you'll notice, oh, I just had a reaction to something. Let me pause and see what that reaction is about. So part of what you're going to hear from us a lot today is slow down and make sure that you're not tired or overwhelmed because that can cause these biases to, to um, play out. And the good news is that they're malleable. We can definitely impact these biases by presencing them and thinking about them. So we do have the opportunity to start interrupting them. All right. I am going to talk just really briefly and before we get into the types of biases about factors that put us at risk. So when we're feeling emotional, such as anger, anxiety, fear, or disgust, that can um, activate our implicit bias. When we're tired, so it's not great to be reviewing candidate files in a hiring process when you're tired, you're more likely to, um, to be acting um, with your bias. If we're distracted, we're more likely to let our bias show up and if we're stressed out. So this is sort of an individual place. So part of what we're gonna ask you when you're doing an important process, like working with your team, evaluating um, somebody you supervise or working on a hiring committee is that you slow down and make sure that you're in a good headspace or good place for that to happen. You might need to take a walk or take a break if you're doing one of these processes to make sure that you aren't letting this implicit bias seep into the process. Um, but there's also structural and societal reasons why we um, engage with bias. Sometimes we don't have clear policy or process for decisions. So if we're on a hiring committee using rubrics, people are so grateful when you give them a rubric, they say, oh, this is just really going to help me interrupt some of these things I don't want to be doing. So giving clear policies really helps. Um, again, lack of processes for feedback and reflection. Sometimes we just evaluate people from a gut feeling. This is how I, I'm feeling about them today. Instead of thinking about over time, can I think about the what they've um, what they've accomplished because I have a process for that feedback and reflection. Um, there can be social pressure that puts us at risk of, of implicit bias. Again, if we're in a sort of that environment where we're not feeling, where we're feeling we have to mask a lot. If you were in that neurodiversity seminar last week, if you're sort of putting on a mask and being a different kind of person in that environment, um, that actually might trigger your implicit bias, but other people, because you're having to hold yourself in a certain way. And then you might feel frustrated about the way that other people are behaving. And then um, if we have lack of diversity in decision-making spaces, that's when we're most likely to make assumptions. So the research about homogenous groups when they're making decisions is that they're more likely to assume we're all on the same page and move forward instead of slowing down and making sure that we might have not have missed something. So if you don't have diversity in your space as you're working on that, you can still work on slowing down to make sure that you're taking bias out of the process. All right, I am gonna, we're gonna start going through the types of bias and we're gonna ask you to engage with our polls again. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jimena. Yes, thank you, Becca. Um, great, so the first uh, bias that we're gonna look into is experience bias. Think uh, shortcut, think quick, okay? Experience bias happens when we take mental shortcuts to confirm our own beliefs and ignore other evidence. This tilts us towards answers that seem obvious, often at the expense of answers that might, be, that might be more relevant or useful. It guides our behavior based on the notion that it is what is most obvious, so it must be true. An example where experience bias is at play. An employee starts coming to work later than others on the team and the supervisor assumes that they're not committed to the current project, even though they are completing their tasks on time. And you will see that in many of our biases, it, it is about filling in with your own narrative. And that's an example of it. Okay, next slide. Okay, so if you um, could use the link that Lucia just put on the chat, 
to give us some examples? You can write phrases or sentences on this one. I think we're, we have a couple of responses that came in from a previous survey here. Yeah. And Just also feel free. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, feel free to unmute if you don't want to write it, you know, if you just want to say it, that's, you know, if it's more effective for you, if you don't mind not doing it and almost anonymously, you can do that too. Mm. Mm-hmm. There's some gray ones here. Mm-hmm. Mm, interesting. Mm. Mm, so great. It, this these are fantastic. These yeah. are great. Mm. These are great. You ready to move to the next slide, Jimena? Yeah, let's do that. Since we have like five different types of bias that we wanted uh, to explore yeah. with you all. Um, yeah, but, lots of yeah. great examples of shortcuts that people you, are making. Yeah, yeah you, you guys are doing fantastic. These are great <laughs> examples. Yes. All righty. So let's go to examples of experience bias. Now we're talking about a supervisory evaluation. Think of the ASA, for example. Better ratings may be given to employees who complete a higher quantity of tasks as it is easier to measure than quality of work. In the hiring process, in, hirings, in hiring, experience bias may happen when we perceive a candidate as overqualified and assume that they will not be interested in the role or the pay offered. On teams, think of a team meeting or team dynamics. A team member is quiet during meetings, often looking at their phone, and other team members make the assumption that this person is disengaged and I'm motivated, okay? And now we offer some tips on how to interrupt expedient bias that go back to our examples. In supervisory evaluation, consider the whole employee instead of selected metrics that describe their work 
making sure the metrics being used are accurate descriptors of performance as opposed to easy talking points, fast to gather metrics. Collecting multiple data points through time, having regular check-ins, taking time with evaluations, and using peer review. In the hiring process, the candidate that is perceived as overqualified may also be the strongest candidate in the pool and may have the reasons for applying to your role, even if you think that salary will be too low for them. On Teams, read about different communication styles to fully understand why people may engage differently during group meetings and to allow for them to make valuable contributions. And you all brought up this idea of the person who's more quiet um, at meetings, right? That goes to personality types. Okay, any questions in the chat? No? Alrighty, let's go on to halo and horn effect. I guess, thank you. So our next slides are about the halo and horn effect. The halo and horn effect is about making snap judgments based on a perceived positive or negative attribute. In both situations, it's a failure to see the candidate as a whole. The halo effect comes into play when one becomes biased by certain positive things about a candidate that have no bearing on their ability to do a job well. The horn effect is the opposite of the halo effect. It comes into play when one cannot move past something they perceive as negative, but unrelated to the job about an applicant. An example of where halo and horn effect is at play a candidate has published extensively in a high impact journal in their field. As a result, hiring committees might overlook potential weaknesses in other areas of their application, such as teaching evaluations or interpersonal skills, assuming that their research prowess indicates overall excellence. And I'll go ahead and it's the same uh, poll link, so you can go ahead and visit there, but I'm putting it in the chat each time in case people are joining. And feel free as this is going, if you have questions you want to put in the chat or comments that you want to make, or feel free to raise your hand. We're trying to make this interactive with you. So feel free to participate in other ways besides the poll. These are so good. I think the comment, the person is more similar to others in the team, so they get a halo that definitely comes into play in some of these biases interact with each other. So there's mm. another one later on that talks about um, similarity bias, but it's absolutely true. So you're making connections, you're jumping ahead, good job. But some great comments about where somebody got their degree or how they dress, um, I think is different than like, if you hear good things about somebody, you don't have to distrust that. Um, I think we're trying to notice where we're having a gut feeling versus a feeling that's based on evidence, that's based on skill sets, that's based on something that person's told us. So try to pull those apart, right? What's your gut instinct versus, oh, I'm actually basing this thought and this feeling on something they've told me or something, uh, an actual performance or skill set. Um, yes, yeah, snowballing up. We're going to use your examples for future training. <laughs> They're so good. Mm. Well, that's such a good point. Sometimes the accent creates halo and sometimes it creates horn. Mm. 
Yeah, this is really highlighting social relationships in the workspace as well. I think it's just so important to start interrupting that the assumptions made because there are people that are not going to be have access to those relationships and they're just not going to have an equal chance to thrive in the work setting. Are you ready, Lucia? Yes, Good. absolutely. Thank you. So here are some examples of halo and horn effect to add on to the ones that you already put in there so expertly. Um, in supervisory evaluation, supervisors will base an employee's ASA rating for the full year on a single positive achievement or difficulty instead of considering the whole period of performance. In hiring process, when reviewing a CV, we can identify a gap in employment for one of the candidates and fill in with our biases on why they were unemployed or why they left a certain organization. We may interpret these facts with a negative narrative without any context. So as Becca was saying, making sure that you're not telling a story about this person that you're basing your, your conclusions in either the ASA or hiring on facts that you have in front of you and not your own internal narrative. On teams, extroverted team members may speak up more frequently as they are given opportunities to present. And we saw you bring that up in your examples very much. So how do we interrupt the halo and horns effect? In supervisory evaluation, consider different parts of performance and include these in the review process. One major accomplishment or lacking skill should not disproportionately impact a rating. This, mean, this means gathering multiple data points to consider the whole picture of performance. This is one of those places where we slow down we take the whole picture of performance into consideration and we have multiple check-ins throughout the year. In the hiring process, stick to the requirements and desired skills included in the job posting at any and all steps in the recruiting process. You should hold all discussions in alignment with these requirements. This might interrupt assumptions made without an employee, about an employee's career path. So coming back to that rubric, on teams, allow for all employees on a team to have growth opportunities instead of picking those who consistently perform well. Any questions about uh, Halo and Horns in the chat? No. No, I don't see any. <clears throat> right, so the next one is affect bias. Affect bias is a bias shortcut our brains take to make decisions quickly based on our current emotions. The problem, of course, is that these decisions often have absolutely nothing to do with whether a person has the right skill set for an employment opportunity. An example of situations where affect bias may show up. If you're having a particularly bad day, you may also have a bad feeling about a candidate, even if it has nothing to do with their qualifications for the job. Like I try not to review candidates on Monday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, in the next slide, we would ask you to please um, give us some examples of that relationship between your emotions and actions that you may take. You might feel like these examples seem really similar, which they are. I think we're just trying to get at bias at lots of different from lots of different angles. So um, feel free to put up something that you've put up already if you think it's also an example. I think the more we see repetitive examples, the more we're going to walk away from this training looking for those things happening in our environment. Oh, that's really good. You're having a bad day and during a meeting, your boss think you think your boss. I have had that happen to me so many times. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Hmm. Well, it goes both ways, right? You're in a good mood. So you say yes, even though maybe you don't have the bandwidth.
Mm. Mm. Okay, these are excellent. Mm. Um, outstanding. Thank you so much for your participation. It really makes a difference. Um, and again, in the interest of, of time, not because these are not interesting, they're awesome, uh, but we're gonna move along and we're gonna um, give you some other examples in the specific scenarios <clears throat> or situations we've been exploring. So in supervisory evaluation, how to interrupt affect bias. Block time on your calendar during a time of day when you're alert and able to focus without interruption. Workplace differences are bound to occur. If they happen around evaluation time, this is especially challenging for supervisors. Try to give any emotional events space and time to settle before making evaluations for employees. If you need support to stay objective, consider mediation, FSAP or FSAP, or other resources. In the hiring process, take time with a friend or colleague to process your frustration. Remember, we're talking about that other situation which affected your mood. Go for a walk before the hiring committee meetings to clear your head and be present during the meeting. Be ready to evaluate candidates based on duties to be performed and requirements announced. On teams, if you have seen anything upsetting during a meeting, take time to talk with other employees about that occurrence. Engage with the feedback training to make sure that you have the skills to navigate th these discussions. Crucial conversations of or Clifton strength can be particularly helpful. And always uh, please feel free to come to Lucia or I when it comes to training. We're very familiar with everything that CU um, Central HR offers. And we have one of our trainers that actually tailors her trainings to the needs of you and your team. So you can always call her in to lead a training for your team, okay? Any other questions? Okay, let's continue. And just to, to clarify, we're gonna capture all of your ideas and we will attach them to the slides. We'll have, an, it might be a separate PDF document, but we will include all of your ideas as part of the posted slides. All right. Thank you. And yes, uh, Gabby, one, one question in the chat. Um, yes, I am developing a feedback training that will be offered sort of in a quarterly way. Um, so that is coming up. Excellent question, thank you. Similarity bias is our next one. Similarity bias or affinity bias is the tendency to favor one candidate over another candidate because you share a characteristic trait or past experience with this candidate. The more similarities you share, the more you will gravitate towards this candidate. This could be the same cultural background, interests, or even having attended the same high school or college. An example of where similarity bias is at play, an employee from a similar background or has similar social identities as the supervisor gets more public acknowledgement and perhaps private encouragement from the supervisor. So here we'll do the same as before. Please give examples where you have seen similarity bias in the workplace. Mm 
Hmm. that comment i think it is a natural human trait to find similarities in your colleagues this is how we make friendships and good working relationships that's absolutely true i think that the place where this training uh is going is how do you make sure that those interpersonal relationships aren't disproportionately impacting hiring evaluations or your interactions with your team as we have a responsibility to to interrupt that and make sure that sure we can obviously be friends and we're going to gravitate towards people who are more similar with, but making sure that that doesn't Im impact our professional relationships disproportionately. And Becca, you can yeah, no, that add was... to that if you want. No, that's great. Certainly no suggestion that, you know, you should interrupt making those friendships at all, just making yeah. sure that they, that they have, a, they hold a place in, in there and they're not, you're not bumping someone out of a candidate pool um, because you went to the same school or things like that. Yeah, we're just trying to interrupt some of those gut feelings we have. So I think it's really, really normal, right, to relate to people with similar hobbies and backgrounds and be attracted to those people. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think we're just trying to make sure that when you're in a work environment, you don't have to be friends with people on your team, right? But how are you treating them? How are you interacting with them? If they are different than you, what are the ways in which you interrupt any gut feelings you have? Or the same thing with the hiring process, right? Somebody, I was just in a hiring process where a CV looked really different than, than the other ones. And we had to stop for a minute and make sure we weren't penalizing that candidate for having a different framework on their CV than we'd seen before and see if we could still look for those skill sets, right? But we all noticed and immediately like, oh, I'm so confused and a little bit of irritation, right? Because we were reviewing so many candidates that day. So it's just just checking those things out, you know, doesn't mean you're not, not you need to interrupt your attraction towards others um, that do feel similar to you. Tricky. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Challenging. All right, are you ready? Yes. Hmm. So here are some. I'm gonna, can we move into interrupting? Just so. Oh, yes, absolutely. We had a ton yeah, we had of. so many examples. good examples. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. And again, these will be captured in the, um, in the follow up materials to this mm -hmm. training so you can read through them for sure. Um, but how to interrupt, very important. In supervisory evaluation, Use objective criteria that is consistent between all employees in a group. If you use peer review, be sure to do this for everyone on your team. Be consistent in your interaction frequency and content with all members of your team. Present development opportunities to all employees. Make an effort to reach out and check in with employees with different schedules, hobbies, or research topics from your own. If you have divergent communication styles, Taking Clifton Strengths training can help you understand how different communication styles can work together effectively. In hiring process, when hiring, please use a rubric in which you rate candidates based on required education, experience, knowledge, skills, abilities, and desired qualifications as stated in the job advertisement. On teams, take time to understand social identities other than your own. Read books, listen to podcasts, join DEI events, Use group norms to address how to communicate and treat each other during and between meetings. Make sure to include all voices in the creation of these norms and ask everyone to help guide the group towards adhering to the norms. Any questions about anything on that slide? Okay. Alrighty, and we're going to go to the last bias we're covering today, which is primacy and recency. And you may get a little bit confused with halo and horn. 
It is a, a similar idea, but primacy and recency deal with timeline. You see something at the beginning, you're not able to um, focus on anything that happened afterwards. And recency, you see something at the end that kind of like makes you forget everything that the person did before. Primacy bias takes place when you focus only on what happened first, ignoring all other aspects of a situation. Recency bias happens when you judge something based only on what happened most recently instead of considering the whole situation. For example, employees may be evaluated more, more favorably if they have recently had an award, publication, or project completed or less favorably if they had a project timeline that was not met or a difficult interpersonal interaction. And again, think timeline. These transient events do not necessarily constitute enough criteria to assign a specific rating. And you can think of the ASAs. Um, in the interest of time, we're gonna skip our um, asking you for examples, and we're gonna look at other examples in the three different scenarios that we've been exploring throughout the presentation. In supervisory evaluation, a recent success or failure should not overly influence the overall performance rating for a year's performance. Remember, ASA goes back to July 1st, 2023. In the hiring process, a candidate's CV and cover letter emphasize an award they received for a recent presentation at the AMS conference. You overestimate that award without noticing that this is the first time this candidate attends a conference. Other candidates with similar profiles may have attended AMS every year in the last decade and gotten similar accolades in a more distant past. On teams, a team member misses an important deadline due to personal challenges and is then removed from a project even after sustained prior good performance. Again, you're focusing on what happened latest. How to interrupt it. In supervisory evaluation, Consider the whole period of performance. Use periodic check-ins to get multiple data points throughout the cycle and refer to these points in the formal evaluations. Encourage employees to keep notes in the ASA application throughout the year and discuss multiple areas, successes and places where support may be needed. In the hiring process, please make sure you review all application materials holistically and not place all focus on more recent achievements or those underlined by the candidate. On Teams, use group norms to allow employees to ask for support when working through personal challenges. Awesome. So I think we're gonna take a couple minutes to discuss um, rec letters and ways to get recommendations in the hiring process and then we're gonna ask you to fill out a survey. And again, just as a reminder, we will stick around after 11 if anybody wants to stay and have discussions with us about particular things that are happening or questions that you have um, about what we've talked about. So we're just including a couple of resources because impact bias can impact the strength of a recommendation letter. There's a resource um, listed here that gives guidance on avoiding racial bias in letter writing and another resource that helps address gender bias in letter writing. Um, that actually gives a gender bias calculator tool so you can put your, your recommendation letter into the tool and analyze the language in your letter. And I just had an example here of a study where they looked at 886 chemistry and biochemistry faculty position letters of recommendation. And they looked at the use of language for male identified candidates versus female identified candidates and saw that the words really shifted. There were standout adjectives used um, for the men's ability and experiences, whereas the women's ability and experiences were not as amplified. And they actually pulled out the words used for men, excellent, outstanding, exceptional, magnificent, unmatched. And for women, careful, thorough, conscientious, hardworking. And these are not, right, they're still supportive words, but it depends on who's reviewing the recommendation letter and what they're pulled towards, right? So if we're just trying to notice that and see if we can um, make sure that we would give the same rec letter, the same types of words or examples for both genders. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to let uh, Jimena talk about skill survey questionnaires for the hiring process. Right, so if you worked um, in a hiring committee with me, um, you know that I am a big fan of skill surveys. Maybe about 10 to 20% of our hiring committees use letters of recommendation. Everybody else has moved to skill survey. 
If it doesn't work for you or for your team, I understand. So let me tell you a little bit about how this work. Skill survey is an online reference check filled by professional references. They can be set up to ask for three answers or for five answers. If it asks for three, you will need at least one supervisor or professor, and that's an entry-level survey. If it asks for five, it would need at least two managers. Again, they can be professors. Questioners vary based on discipline. You can always ask me to find a good survey for you, and Central HR helps us in doing that. Referees are asked to use a numerical scale of one through seven to rate candidates on the areas of professionalism, interpersonal skills, problem solving and adaptability, personal value commitment and ability to work remotely. Referees are given instructions on how to use the numerical scale. Skill survey will map the score of your employee through comparisons to thousands of other candidates rated through the same specific questioner. So outside the university, outside the state, outside the country, I believe. Referees, um, yeah, skill survey will, will group all raters in one big average score. That includes all the raters and also provide a second rating corresponding to only managers. Traditionally, the manager only score is lower than the one that includes also your colleagues. Okay. Uh, yes, one or two managers are required. Uh, all questions include a rater differential, which helps in determining agreement, agreement or disagreement between raters. And I always give the same example. We had a case in which the rating for to answer the question, this person meets deadlines. So this person had around a four, which is not a good score, or anything below a six, calls for a second thought or more questions. Now, how do we know if this person met the deadline sometimes? What do people think? Well, the rater differential was zero, which means that everyone gave this person a four. So there was no difference in their opinions. They're, they all agree that this person met the deadlines sometimes. And Next, yeah. So skill survey has focused questions related to job performance and professional skills. And thus questions force evaluators to rate candidates on work-related competencies, leaving, it should be EA, leaving little room for open narrative and personal information. Skill survey asks all raters to identify both strengths and areas of needed improvement. This helps us identify red flags or targeted areas for supervisors to further explore or improve up or improve upon um, in the first years. So that's my concern with letters of recommendation that the format doesn't invite the areas of concern. That's not what we see in a letter of recommendation or if we see it is maybe one out of a thousand letters. You may still contact the references by email or invite them to join a call to discuss qualifications further or to elaborate on lower rated areas. So you can still talk to the raters and pick the ones who are managers, okay? Any questions? Um, let's see, okay. We do have a couple questions, but I, I wanna give just a minute to, for people to engage with the feedback yeah. survey in case people need to go to a meeting at 11 a.m. Um, the feedback survey is anonymous. It just has three questions. And what we're hoping you'll do is reflect on what you learned today, but then also give us feedback because the culture survey has indicated that we need to be offering this training pretty frequently. And so we would like to continue offering it maybe quarterly. And so we'd love to get your feedback on what could make it more successful or more applicable for um, series employees and their federal partners. So if you don't mind taking a minute to click on the feedback survey in the chat, and we'll just be quiet for a minute or two to let you fill it out. And then we're going to address two really important questions in the chat about skill surveys.
Um, just based on a couple comments coming in, uh, there is a request to maybe have a longer training. Um, I think we're trying to navigate um, people's time, but that is a good comment. And perhaps we need to engage some bystander training um, as part of this, because I think there's this feeling that like, oh, we can sit and talk about this, but then let's really get real about what it means to engage with it in real time. And I think that was great feedback. Awesome. All right, so Jimena, do you wanna answer? We have some, yes. um, yes. some links in the chat, just the link that's there for the newsletter is the DEI newsletter if you'd like to sign up for that. Yeah. Great, right. so April's question. I recently heard that supervisors will give an employee a good review to get rid of a problem employee. I like to know how to get the real answers. Well, first of all, unless it's a very entry level position, I always recommend that people use a skill survey with five answers. Um, which is the standard report. So that employee you will give, I mean, you will give yourself a better shot at getting uh, the truth. There's nothing you know, that we can do with a person that is answering who has no integrity that is doing this, just you know, give good reviews that are not truthful. There is no much that you can do to control the situation. But um, you know, I think that if you ask for uh, three letters of recommendation as opposed to one, if you ask for five responses as opposed to three, uh, that can help. And you have to keep in mind also that it is hard in skill survey. It happens only, I think, about 6% of the time that the ratings are less than a six. So people are choosing you know, um, referees who they think they're going to give them a good rating, uh, whether or not these are... Uh, I, I want to believe that the majority of the people are giving an honest review. We can really not do anything about those who are lying to get rid of a, of a bad employee. I'm sorry. And then, Mark, um, can you uh, mute yourself and talk a little bit about what you mean uh, starting, meaning like going over more obstacles? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Like, like for example, I, I'm I'm writing reference letters now for a, a, a colleague from Ethiopia who's been through a lot in the last five years. And if you compare him just on surveys, uh, just on his skills compared to other people his age in the United States, he's not gonna, he's not gonna match up. But there are extenuating circumstances here. He's, yeah, yeah, you know, he's, he, he shows a lot of promise and, and, it's not the full story of how good he is at Python programming. Yeah. So my question to you would be, um, can you use the rubric to determine if the, this person can do the job and if they can do the job well? So hopefully the skill survey is only one part of a bigger equation. Hopefully you had a screening call or higher view. You had a long interview, meaning 45 minutes to an hour. You had team discussions and potential is a really good uh, quality. And for example, when we look for software development positions, a common question for me is, do you really need a bachelor's degree? Not everyone has the money to go to college. Do you really need that, right? Or is a person who has the experience as a software development, you know, as good, the same as someone who was, you know, um, able to go to college and, and afford that, which is not true for everyone. So I think you have to stay true to what you uh, said you needed when you um, when you wrote the job description. You cannot give pers give someone a job because they had a hard past, but you can give someone a job just because they show the the desire to learn and to work and they meet all the minimal qualifications that you said without those, the job cannot be performed. So that's, does that someone address your, your question? Yeah, thank you. I, I've got to run to another meeting, but this was great. Thank, thank you so much for coming. Thanks, Mark. I think Andy also brings up that you get more context in a reference letter. Um, you can follow up, right, with phone calls to references too, right? Even if you use skill survey, yeah. Do people do that? So you can do phone calls and talk to people. In my experience, and this is also the the recommendation or the statement from the 
Director of Talent Acquisition at CU, Andy Horowitz. When people are identified by name and last name, for example, in a phone call, they're less likely to express their areas of concern just because mm -hmm. of liability issues in this country, right? Mm -hmm. So skill survey being anonymous, um, it is, I think there is a bigger chance that you will get the candid answers. Um, our theory is that once you call the person on the phone, the person who rated force throughout is less likely to tell you with their name and last name, I will be, you know, concern I would recommend against you hiring because they agreed to do a recommendation. And so it's different. Anonymous feedback is, is um, I guess it gives people a lot more courage that then they don't have to answer on the phone once they're identified by, by name and, and phone number. I think I'm getting away from the question. 